What's up, y'all? This is Joseph R. Wheeler, the third, the artist, the founder, and the president of the Honest Con Foundation. A big part of Honest Con's content now is travel. We're doing travel vlogs. I'm taking you guys and gals with me all over the world to show y'all places you've either been, want to go, and probably things you never did or would like to do or that you're interested in doing and just love to watch other people do it because it inspires you to keep moving towards your dream of doing it, right? So if you haven't seen our Malaysia content, make sure you go and watch the Malaysia full, full series. And because all the ones I've done so far, I did the food, I did fishing, I did uh, just riding around, I did, uh, what else was one of the topics? I did the beach, I did all those different things. I did a lot of it and it's out there. So check it out, check it out. Trust me, you're gonna be blown away if you have never been to Malaysia. If you're from Malaysia, you're gonna love it. If you've never been, you're gonna love it. You're gonna love it, period. It was Kuala Lumpur area and surrounding areas, Port Dixon, Puchong, and a lot of other places. Uh, I was just watching something the other night, one of my favorite channels, Ace Live. Shout out to Ace, what's up Ace? That's a good brother right there, you know what I'm saying? He's, he's written me back a few times when I've reached out to him. I did a video to salute him here on Honest Con and he appreciated that. You know, he literally got back to me personally and told me he appreciated it, so ace, real dude. But I was watching some of his content. He was talking to a bro who, um, let me see, where were they? I think they were in, I think they were in San Francisco, yeah. And he was talking about, he was, he was talking to another content creator who travels, does travel vlogs. And the guy was explaining how in some of his travels, he had been everywhere. I mean, he had been in Europe, he had been in parts of Asia, he had been a lot of places, but he was talking about being in a Muslim country, a country that's dominated by Islam. And he wasn't speaking negative of it, but he just told the truth that a lot of times it can be very strict, you know? And so uh, I, as soon as he said that, I was like, Psh, yeah, yeah, that's real, you know? It didn't affect my trip so much, um, it could have in some ways, but it didn't. But I did, because, you know, Malaysia is a Muslim country dominated by Islam. And um, and like I say, that's not, I'm not someone who has any issues with that. I got plenty of Muslim friends and all of that. So that wasn't the thing. It's just that when you're in a country that's serious about it, they're serious about it. You know, you can't do certain things in public. You can't, um, you know, they, they say, you know, if you're with a lady, it's it's frowned upon or it's odd for you to have public displays of affection, which was odd for me coming from America because, I mean, you know, it's a choice here. You know, you do it if you want to, you don't do it if you don't want to, and it's, and it's how far you want to go here. Everybody knows there's, you can do it, but there's limits. Like, you know, you and your lady can be on a park bench making out, getting it in real good, tonguing each other up and everything, but when you start groping body parts, rubbing up under clothes and taking things off, okay, you going to jail, you know what I mean? Even even the kissing might start something with the right place, right time, it, you know. You know what I mean? You gotta be careful about that kind of thing, but it's not, it's not as big a deal in America, it's just not. Whereas there it is, and people from there, you know, if, you, if you're lucky enough to know somebody from there like I did, they might have an issue with you, you know? Not because they don't wanna do things with you, and express their interest in you and their love for you, their affection for you, whatever, whatever level y'all on, but they definitely might bring it up that, you know, who don't do that, don't do this, whatever. And when I first got there, that was weird to me. I was like, huh? Like, okay, I knew this was a thing, but I didn't know it was like serious. I mean, we would joke about it before I got there. So anyway, I got there and it was a thing. I said, oh, like you for real? like." What's gonna happen? Like, am I gonna go to jail? And they're like, no, nah, it ain't that serious, but it's just, do you want that energy? Like every time we do something, everybody's staring us down and frowning upon us. I mean, do you want that that vibe? And I was like, yeah, you know, that will get on my nerves. So so I just, you know, I pulled back a lot. But, um, cause I'm not the kind of person to be all over a lady in public anyway, and definitely ain't trying to touch nobody inappropriately in public. You know what I'm saying? But a hug, a kiss, Kiss on the lips, kiss on the cheek, kiss on the forehead. Yeah, all day, frequently, holding hands. Let's go, that's me and you, that's man and woman, let's go, let's do that, you know? But even even some of that can sometimes get folks, you know, scaring or whatever. And then with you being from another place and the person's of another ethnicity, you know, you got people who look at it like, you know, these are our 
women and blasphemy. I mean, you know, if the person you're with is bold enough to do it, so what? Who cares what anybody else thinks? True. But, do you, like you say, do you want the energy? I mean, it's a, it's a weird feeling when you, you know, everybody knows what it feels like to be stared at. Personally, I done dealt with that in other ways in America, so I don't care. I mean, it's like walking into a, being a black man, going somewhere where the population is mostly white in the deep south. I'm from the south, from Atlanta. And you go somewhere where there's barely any black folk, and you might get some stares. You might get ignored. You might get a lot of vibes, you know? And I don't appreciate it, but I expect it sometimes if I'm in certain areas, and I'm prepared for it. Now, if I'm on vacation in a total other country, you know, I've researched how their perspective may be about black people, you know, in, a, in Malaysia, they can't really get an angle on a guy like me because I think a lot of times people couldn't figure out what I was, you know, the way I dress or whatever, and, and that was a variety. Some days I'm sporty like I am today. I'm wearing one of my jerseys or whatever, you know what I'm saying, long sleeve. It's, it's not one that I design when I say my jersey. I'm just saying, you know, I like jerseys, so it's something that, that I bought. Uh, this is a Morgan State call it shooter jersey for like basketball practice. I didn't even know what it was when I bought it. I got it. In, I got it brand new, brand new, y'all at Goodwill. You know, uh, yeah, I, I definitely love Goodwill. Oh my gosh, <laughs> I am a thrift shopper for some fly stuff. I love it. But anyway, you know, I wear stuff like that sometimes. When I was there, I wear stuff like, of course, my Honest Con Fishing Tournament jersey uh, with all the logos and everything on the new one, as bright as it was. I got stairs when I wore, wore that, of course. I mean, everybody look, I knew that was, I mean, it is, that's what it's for. It's meant to be looked at like, whoa, what is that? Who is that? What are all those logos? I mean, yeah, with that, I expect it. I, I'm, I'm, I'm asking for the energy as long as it's positive, right? And no, no bad vibes, just, you know, kind of, <laughs> what is that? You know, kind of looks. Um, but then, you know, I wore polos and uh, cargo style shorts. I wear tactical style. I mean, I, I like the heavy shorts. You know, I don't like none of these little skinny jeans, skinny shorts, none of that garbage. I, I wear real workwear stuff. That's my style. I like that. You know. Forever in the day. I'm, I'm from 90s hip hop. I'm from hunting and fishing. This is this is what I wear. You know, I like that. So anyway, I had on stuff like that. And, you know, so I knew I stood out. I don't look like, and then I'm taller than most of the people. So besides a few of the groups of people, uh, most of the Malay are short. Some of the Indians are tall. Some of the um, Chinese are tall. Those are the three main groups. And then you got a lot of other people from all over. So, you know, you stand out a little bit. And people will look at you like, okay, who is that? You know? And then when I have on my baseball cap, like I wore this cap when I was out there, but I also had like baseball cap. And I'm wearing fittings and stuff. So I know sometimes people, I, lo I know, I did notice most men, most uh, young kids, only very young kids wore baseball caps. <laughs> and I made jokes about it when I was there. I was like, oh, I, only me and the little kids know what's cool. You know, it's like, or whatever. But, and I'm the type of dude, like, there was a time in my life I didn't even wear a lot of baseball caps. I came back into this as I got older. I felt like, okay, for a personal reason, I felt like, all right, I'm old enough now if I wear a baseball cap. You still get the stigma of some of what that is in America being black, being a black man, and the association with being a rapper and hip-hop culture and everything. I'm hip-hop, for sure. I claim hip-hop, but I don't claim all parts of what other people might label as hip-hop. So if someone wants to think I'm automatically super hood or street, gutter old gangster, I, you know, I came from nothing, but I made it. So then that's why I'm over here traveling or I'm some kind of weird hustler doing something shady. And that's how I got my plane ticket and I got over here. No, I don't want none of that energy, right? But I know some of that BS can exist in the minds of people because that's the images that have been perpetrated here in America. They get pushed everywhere else, either by black folk making images about themselves or the media creating stuff about us. And so if you get all that over years and years and years and generations, you know, people start getting a perception of you and thinking they know what you buy before you open up your mouth, you know? And we get that here, so nothing's worse than all of the mess we go through here, you're gonna go through in other places too because of that. It's a sad reality, right? So I, I would get certain looks, like I remember when I was in the Turkish airport, Istanbul, on my way to, K, uh, to KL, to Kuala Lumpur, it was like, 
most people really honestly didn't pay me much attention at all. I'm gonna be real with you. Like, don't think it's just constant stares. I didn't get most of the stares until I was in Malaysia. I would occasionally get looks in the airport in Turkey. People from all over the world, of course, it's an airport, it's an international airport, it's a it's a it's a hub for flights to all kind of places, so you got all kind of people there. But most of the people that I've observed were either Turkish, other Middle Eastern, um, Europeans from all over, you know, Western European. And every now and then I would see somebody black. And they would usually be from Africa, and I could tell, because not only sometimes with their dress, but I'd get close enough to them to hear them talking, and I know, okay, yeah, 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 that's West Africa all day. She and her kids and them, they probably Yoruba or whatever, you know what I mean? I would easily be able to, because I know people, I know people here. I know Yoruba, I know Igbos, I know, I've met houses, but Igbos and Yoruba, especially in Atlanta, I know people. Uh, I've met people from Senegal, I've met people from, and I, and I know them, man. I got friends from these places here in Atlanta, people I consider good friends in the art world that support Honest Kind and know me or whatever. So, you know, I would hear certain accents and i say, oh yeah, I know what that is, yep, 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 yep. And those would be the only black folk I saw. I mean, I think I saw like one brother walking around. He had a baseball cap on, a jersey, some Jordans, you know, looking very American hip hop esque, you know, because that kind of, we, hey, we can do anything we want with hip hop. We can look any way we want it to look. But I'm just saying, he had one of those looks, one of the many. And, and uh, I think we, we, we glanced at each other for a minute and just kind of nodded and kept walking, like, yeah, you know, I see you, bro. We the only ones here. They're probably from America like that, and I, I see you, you know, and that's it, just acknowledgement. Um, but when I was in Malaysia, like, whether I had on one of my caps like this, whether I was walking around with the baldy out, which if I was outside, most of the time I had on a cap, or whatever I was wearing, you know, a nice polo. Sometimes, you know, I went out at night, date vibes with my lady friends. Yo, you know, I'm in a, I'm in a, uh, as I remember, I think I had a, a button down. Yeah, I had a button down shirt on, you know, some khakis and stuff you know some loafers so i wouldn't get a lot of looks in any of the outfits except for maybe when i had the baseball cap on that's when everybody not everybody but enough people would kind of give me this look like almost a who is that look like i, I really think that you could attribute that to television and people assuming oh you know are you are you famous are you some singer or rapper or something and all that stuff because of what they see on tv you know, and then I'm in a certain age look, so they think, oh yeah, you know, he's young enough or not too old enough to be this, 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 and this. So people assume stuff, right? And then I'm walking around with somebody who's a native from there, you know, of one of the one of the main groups, and she speaks the language and stuff. So that made everything a lot easier. But it would be so funny because, like, if I ask somebody a question, they'd be so busy looking. They they would always do this weird stare for a minute. Some friendly, it wouldn't be hostile most of the time. It'd just be curious, just super curious, without being said. And I was always, always never failed to be like this delay in answering my question. Like first I say, "Hey, how you doing?" You're like, "Hey, yeah, hello." You. And they might say salam, or you know, you know, wassalam alaikum. You know, you say something in in Arabic like that, but then it have a twist to it because it's got the local dialect and all of that. And <laughs> and then I'd be like, so you, you speak English? And they say, yes, yes. Sometimes they want to say it real quick, like real confident, like, of course I do. Yeah, yeah, I speak English. And then you just start talking, and then they're looking at you like, like, huh? Uh, I'm like, why you say you speak English? You can't catch my words. <laughs> I speak real clear. I wasn't, I wasn't going into any local dialects from Atlanta. I wasn't, you know, I wasn't like, hey, shawty, yo, I'm just trying to find out, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, why y'all looking at me crazy? Like, they just, they were not ready a lot of times. And they would be obviously well-educated folks who just are getting a real quick reality check or I thought I knew English until I met somebody from somewhere who speaks it really, really, and I'm not ready. Or I'm so in um, amazement of who they are and how they look or whatever, I can't even get my words together. I can't even figure out what I want to say to them. So then my friend would come in and always talk and everything would flow. And I just laugh like, okay. Lesson learned. When you go places, it it is it is just a thing. If you can be with someone from there, I promise you, it makes life easier. It does. It just really does. And and I know I've, I've done that for other people visiting me, 
you know, most of that was folk coming from other places in America here to Atlanta. But still, just, you know, I know I made their life a lot easier because they didn't have to figure stuff out. They didn't have to wonder if they were in a safe neighborhood. I'm not taking you around no people that's gonna harm you. I'm, if we're anywhere where there is a slight bit of danger, I'm gonna make sure we get in at the right times and get out at the right times, you know, be a host, be, be somebody who shows, you know, take care of your friend, you know? So shout out to her for that. She did that. She definitely did that for show, for show, and for show. Uh, and it made life so much easier. So I would, I would, I've learned from that situation in travel, you definitely want to go places where you got to connect, you know, whether it's a, a, you know, a close connection, intimately, whatever it may be, or just a homie, a friend, it's gonna look out for you and take you around and make sure you're safe and get you in and get you out. That, that's just that's just the way I like to travel. You know, you got a lot of different things. You got backpacker folk who like, they'll go stay in a hostile, I mean, I'm a hostile, a hostile, a hostile, hostile. Not the hostiles are always hostile, but you know, I've heard good stories, I've heard bad. None of it ever interested me. I think that's more for, it's definitely for younger folks mostly. I know, I know older people who travel and that's all they stay in. I've met people who, when I used to work with senior citizens, I knew a lady that I taught in one of my art classes, I used to teach art classes at a senior center, and she had traveled everywhere. It was amazing, her stories, right? But when she would break down how she got in and out, I said, oh yeah, you're doing some stuff I don't see myself doing. Like, I'm a nature dude, I can rough it, I have roughed it, but I don't want to rough it the older I get. I don't want to, like, I've been camping probably four or five times in my life. And I'm talking about real camping, you know what I'm saying? On the ground, in the tent, both out in the middle of nowhere, sort of, and also in a camping ground area that's generally safe. But still, you in the elements. Like, you know, if a wild animal come through there that night, they come through there, you know? Somebody leave some food out, there could be a bear staring at you in the morning, you know? I've, I've done all that stuff, and I, would, I won't say I won't ever do it again, but I know if I ever do a tent again, I want one of them tents that it's like a room in a house. You set that mug up, you put some heaters in the corner if it get cold at night, you got a straight up king size blow up bed. I mean, I'm sorry y'all, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm in my 40s. I refuse to rough it for the rest of this life if I can help it. If I can help it, if I got a choice of either not going or raising the money to do it right the way I want it on my standards, otherwise I'm not dealing with it. Just make sure you do that if you go somewhere and somebody can look out for you that way. And also, I would add in transportation. If they have a car, oh my gosh, another big, huge kudos to my friend and what they did for me. Because, you know, I could pay for the gas, so they ain't had to worry about that. At one point in the trip, I was paying for all the tolls and everything. So, it's a good feeling when you know you can help out like that. And also, they're helping you out, so you're helping them out, so everybody's, it's a win-win. That's what you want. You want that in all parts of a situation, right? And uh, yeah, there it is, y'all. I don't, don't want to run out of steam and be coasting on vapor, so I'm gonna go ahead and end this one, but I hope y'all got something out of this more soon.